As the year went by, Robert had composed a growing number of pieces, including intermezzi for piano and piano burlesques in the style of his earlier work, Papillon. He also formed a musical magazine, the Neue Leipziger Zeitschrift für Musik, containing articles, critiques, and commentaries on composers and compositions. In 1833, the 14-year-old Clara Wieck's fame as a concert pianist elevated, and by this time, Schumann began to develop feelings for her. He had previously been very fond of her, much more so as the years rolled by. Clara is as fond of me as ever, and is just as she used to be, wild and enthusiastic skipping and running about like a child and saying the most profound things. It's wonderful to see how her gifts of mind and heart develop faster and faster. The other day, as we were walking back from Konovitz, we go for two or three hours hike every day. I heard her say to herself, Oh, how happy I am! How happy! Who would not rejoice to hear them? Some time later, the deaths of his sister-in-law and brother upset him seriously again. He experienced stress and physical fatigue. This took a toll on his body and overall state of mind. He was having suicidal thoughts at the time and acquired a dread of living in the upper floors of houses. Robert's accounts in his diary show that he thought he was losing his mind. But all of these were surpassed as he applied himself to hard work on the Zeitschrift and on composing. He became very busy with his work. Yet Robert constantly yearned for affection and inspiration. He became infatuated with 17-year-old Ernestine von Fricken, who came to Leipzig in 1834 to study with Wieck. They were secretly engaged, yet upon discovering Ernestine's origins, the engagement was broken off mutually. The affair had a subsequent effect on his compositions, with him writing the carnival and piano variations by the girl's father. In 1835, Robert Schumann met Mendelssohn, Chopin, and Moscheles at the Vieks. He also saw much of Clara, and this cheered him up. He finished his first piano sonata, which was dedicated to her. After the death of his mother in 1836, Robert became emotionally entangled in his own conflicts. Wieck did not approve of Clara and Robert's relationship and demanded that they should not see each other or correspond in letters. Despite these hindrances, the two lovers still found ways of communicating with each other behind Wieck's back. In 1837, they were secretly engaged. On Clara's 18th birthday, Robert wrote a letter to Wieck asking for his consent to marry Clara, but Wieck's response remained unchanged. The Weeks went away for most of 1837 as Robert busied himself again with work on the magazine. In 1838, he produced the Kreisleriana, a series of piano pieces he dedicated to Clara and wrote to her to play it often, as it mirrored their love and their lives, according to Schumann. I am affected by everything that goes on in this world and think it all over in my own way, politics, literature, and people. 
Then I yearn to express my feelings and find an outlet for them in music. That is why my music is sometimes difficult to understand, because it is linked to remote interests, and sometimes striking, because everything extraordinary that happens impresses me and forces me to express it in music. The year 1839 brought another blow to Robert as he learned about the death of his other brother. A family crisis ensued, and to add to it, Clara, who was echoing her father, was now insisting on financial security before marrying Robert. Robert deemed himself prepared, yet Vic resisted all pleas. In September 1839, Clara signed an affidavit for her father's consent to be set aside. The moment I signed was the most important of my whole life. I set my name down with resolution and was inexpressibly happy. Vic did not take the filing of the affidavit well and later formed a document with impossible provisions for the couple to gain his consent. The couple then took legal action and was granted by the courts to proceed with their marriage. The wedding took place on September 12, just before Clara's 21st birthday. What can I write about this day? We were married at Schoenfeld at 10 o'clock. First came a chorale and then a short address by the preacher. His sermon was simple but heartfelt. My whole soul was filled with gratefulness to the one who had brought us safely over many rocks and precipices to meet at last. I prayed fervently that he would preserve my Robert to me for many, many, many years. Indeed, the thought that I might one day lose him is enough to send me out of my mind. Following the marriage, Schumann experienced a great outburst of creativity. 
he met with Liszt and received an honorary doctor's degree for his compositions and writings at the University of Vienna. The year 1840 was his famous Year of Song, wherein he composed Lieder based on the poems by Heine, Liederkreis and Dichter Liebe. After an interval of some 12 years, Robert was now back on track and was flooded with musical ideas for his leader. Clara surely served as his inspiration for most of his compositions. At this point, Wieck realized he had underestimated Robert and reconciled with his daughter and son-in-law. Suffice to say, the next few years were the happiest in Schumann's life. He was a devoted husband and his affections were returned by Clara. Though an ideal couple, they had some artistic clashes which left Clara's piano playing to suffer. My playing is getting all behind, as always happens when Robert's composing. I can't find a single hour in the day to myself, if only I didn't get so behind. By then, Robert had shown his interest in symphonies and writing other larger works. They were occasionally invited to other places with Clara playing on the piano. His works for the orchestra were also premiered, although received no critical acclaim. He was aware of the fact that he was only an appendage to Clara when she went on tours, so he went back to Leipzig and worked on the Zeitschrift while drowning himself in beer and champagne. Clara's return brought a new wave of joy and with it a new wave of compositions. At certain periods of time, he also felt his health begin to wane. In 1843, he was appointed professor of piano, which improved their financial state but Robert was not a success as a mentor. Within the year he met with Berlioz, who favored Robert's piano quintet and worked on a setting of Thomas More's Paradise and the Peri, an oratorio. Robert and Clara went on another tour, this time to Russia. Throughout the tour, Robert had bouts of depression, suffering from stress, from losing composing time, and felt he was inferior to Clara. When they arrived in Leipzig, he resigned from his post at the Zeitschrift and continued his attempts at completing operas, frequently changing his mind on what to write. Unfortunately, in August 1844, Robert had a nervous breakdown and listening to music became unbearable. The stress of the past years had finally caught up with him. He got better after a while, and afterwards left Leipzig to live at Trestin. Upon arrival at Trestin, the Schumanns met and worked with Ferdinand Hiller to enliven the local music scene. Richard Wagner was also at work as Kapellmeister, proving a difficult man to deal with as he and Robert differed in their views and in their styles. Robert felt isolated in Dresden and kept constant communication with his dear friend Mendelssohn, with whom he shared a deep admiration for Johann Sebastian Bach. Robert still composed for the piano at this point, with works that premiered at the height of his romantic vigor. Still, his health was unstable as he described in his letters to Mendelssohn. Unfortunately, I haven't recovered my normal strength. Any disturbance of the simple pattern of my existence throws me off balance and into a nervy, irritable state. That is the reason, which I much regret, why I preferred to stay at home when my wife was with you. Whenever there is fun and enjoyment, I keep well away. The only thing is to hope. He tried composing more works, but he was experiencing a block. 
The only things keeping him going were Clara's love and his growing family. He sank deeper and deeper into despair, unable to finish his compositions. He was haunted by the lunatic asylum in Dresden, which he could see from his window, and began worrying about the future. In the meantime, Clara's popularity diminished, and there were only a few performances of his works during the years 1846 to 1847. Within these years, the deaths of his youngest child and his friend Mendelssohn left him depressed. In 1848, Robert was appointed conductor of the Choral Society, and for a while he was happy. He even finished his opera Genoveva during the same year. In 1849, the Dresden uprising disturbed the peace and Robert was inspired and composed something out of the events that happened around him. In 1850, the Schumanns decided to move to Dusseldorf, where the music scene was livelier. They were welcomed warmly, meeting new people and young musicians with potential. Among them were the violinist Josef Joachim and composer Johannes Brahms. Both became close with the Schumanns, premiering some of his works in Dresden. Soon, Robert was having difficulties in conducting and was clearly suffering from his ill health. In 1854, his mental stability began to deteriorate. He had hallucinations and would often hear music in his head angelic and demonic, as he described it, and could not bear it any longer. My poor Robert suffers terribly. All sounds are transformed for him into music. He has said several times that if it does not stop, he'll go out of his mind. The trouble with his ears has now got to the point of his hearing great symphonic pieces played right through, with the last note held on until another piece comes into mind. Robert got up, but was more wretched than words can say. If I even touched him, he said, Ah, Clara! I am not worthy of your love. He said this, the one to whom I am always looked up with the greatest, the deepest reverence, and nothing I could say was of any use. Only later did Clara discover that Robert had thrown himself into the Rhine River and fishermen had rescued him. On March 4, 1854, Robert was finally taken to a private asylum at Endenich, near Bonn. Sometimes he was able to write rationally to his friends, sometimes he was not. In 1855, Dr. Richards informed Clara that Robert was incurably insane. He now suffered from disorders of taste and smell and deep depression. He soon had convulsions and difficulty in moving his limbs. Clara was summoned on July 27, 1856. I saw him between 6 and 7 in the evening. He smiled and put his arms around me with enormous effort, for he cannot now control his limbs. I shall never forget it. Not all the treasure of this world could equal his embrace. My Robert, in such a way we saw each other again. How bitter it was to trace your dear features. What a tragic sight. Two and a half years ago, you were dragged from me with no farewell. 
though your heart must have been full. Now I lay at your feet, hardly daring to breathe, and just now I've been glimpsing a look clouded but unutterably gentle. Two days later, Robert was freed from his suffering forever. He fell asleep and passed away in the afternoon and was buried on July 31 in Bonn. His head was beautiful, the forehead so transparent and slightly arched. I stood by the body of my beloved husband and I was at peace. All my feelings were taken up and thanks to God that Robert was at last free and as I knelt by his bed I was filled with awe. It was as though his sacred spirit was hovering over me. If only he had taken me with him.